Shumai. Welcome to my wild Welsh garden. I did the garden bird watch last weekend run by the RSPB. And one of the things that uh, you have to do is sort of describe your garden, sort of what size it is and uh, what kind of things it has in it. So it's like, do you have a pond? Tick. Do you have a lawn? Tick. Do you have trees? Tick. And one of the things was, do you have a wildlife area? And I thought, well, no, I don't have a wildlife area. I have a wildlife garden. And then I thought, but that's the conventional way of gardening, that you have a wildlife area and it's usually sort of tucked away a little bit out of sight uh, because the inference is that it's, you know, a bit untidy and not very nice to look at and uh, not really very nice to sort of spend time in. And that for me is the challenge here. Can I make uh, a garden which is really good for wildlife with a lot of biodiversity and also looks pretty and beautiful and that people want to spend time in. And then I thought, well, that's how I used to garden because as I've uh, said before, I've been a conventional gardener all my life. So when I came here, I had a wildlife area. It isn't actually in my garden. It's at the front of my house over the road. And it's a bit of uh, land. I think it was originally allotments that goes down to the river. And then it was used to dump a whole load of builder's rubble on from some buildings uh, of a little estate behind my house uh, a few years ago. And it's really just been left um, just to be colonised by whatever wants to colonise it. And that uh, was always my wildlife area. And that's where the sort of native plants and shrubs and trees and the wild plants, uh, although it was it's actually proved very difficult to get anything established over there and, and I'll explain why uh, a bit later. But yeah, so the convention is that, you know, the native wild plants go in the wildlife area and the uh, cultivars and the non-native plants go in, in the garden because they're prettier and have bigger flowers and are more attractive and not so many pests. So, yeah, so I think it kind of demonstrates how my thinking has changed. Well, today was supposed to be sunny, um, so I don't quite know what's happened to the weather, but I am promised that it is going to get better. So I thought, while I'm waiting for the weather to improve, and then I'll come out here and get on with uh, doing some more of the, uh, removing the wood chips and putting slate down, I thought I'd uh, introduce you to my over the road and uh, you can see what's happening. When we bought the cottage, we didn't know that this was included. It's just that this estate agent phoned me up one day and said uh, there was a little piece of land over the road and uh, did we want to have that? And I said, well, yeah, of course I did. And uh, so this is mine as well. And it goes all the way down to the river at the bottom of the valley. But it's very, very steep and I actually can't get down that way. If I want to go to the bottom bit, I have to walk along the road up there and then there's a path that goes down to the river and then I walk all the way along the river back to um, my little bit of land here. When we came, it was completely barren because next door... I'll show you in a bit more detail in a minute, is a wood store where a gentleman used to have a, a wood uh, business where he used to, you know, saw up logs for people to put in their wood stoves. And uh, because the old man that lived in the house never came, came out, I don't think, he'd sort of used this land to do his wood chopping. And he'd... Um, covered it in herbicides, killed all the weeds with herbicides and it was just a wasteland. And uh, he, he, he knocked on my door once and said, uh, do you want me to do your weeds? And I said, I beg your pardon. And he said, uh, do you want me to spray your weeds? I said, uh, no. <laughs> he, well, he said, well, I used to do it for Dewey. And I said, well, no, I don't want you to put herbicides anywhere near my plot of land. And I do think actually he stopped spraying his, so that's good. So that's the wood store 
and all sorts of bits of wood and stuff. And it, but it used to look very different. Um, as I say, he had his business here and he used to saw up uh, trees with, uh, with a chainsaw, but fortunately uh, he stopped very soon after we moved. And so I've planted a native hedge along there. This was sort of left over from the hedge that I put along the back of my garden. And I've not touched that really, so that's just grown up. And I asked this chap's advice because he, he also um, does a sort of tree surgery and um, sort of big jobs in people's gardens, cutting trees down and, and hedges and stuff. But he does lay hedges and he said to leave that for a couple of years and then he, he would lay it for me. So that's good. And then on the other side there is a dead hedge, which I started last year. And behind that is a, a lovely bramble patch, um, which is just left really to, to run riot. And then that piece of land has just been left for years and years and years. But unfortunately, the owner has put in planning permission to build a house which is such a shame because it's a fabulous area for wildlife and it does just show how vulnerable wildlife is to human beings just coming along and removing it all because what will happen is they'll just get the diggers in and the choppers in and chop everything out and down and dig it all out um, but the, the, the dead hedge will stay because that's actually on my land um, so my, my land will stay as it is and it will be a, a little wildlife corridor from the, from the woods and the rivers down there. And bringing you over here is a little bit relevant to, to my garden uh, by my house because these are hazel poles which have come from a hazel tree down by the river. Um, which I, I cut some off last year to make the little pergola where I hang the, the bird feeders outside my back door. But it, it really needs to be a bit more substantial if it's going to last. So that's the plan for those, is that I'm going to sort of add them to the pergola that's there and, as I say, make it, make it a bit more robust. But uh, my, my next door neighbour, Liam, uh, Liam the Chainsaw, I call him, he, he helped me do that last week, or, or was it the week before? And um, yes, I do have to say, having a, a, a big, strong bloke with all the gear and all the kit, because that's what he does, was so helpful. Because we did in a, in a morning, I think, what would have, well, I couldn't have done it on my own, so... So yeah, thank you. Thanks, thanks to Liam for that. So the hazel tree is down there somewhere. Uh, you might be able to see the path along the river and the river right down there. And then that's the main road that goes from Swansea to Sunnybridge, goes up towards Abanai Brachaniog. Brecon Beacons as was. And this is a, a huge ash tree which seems to be surviving the ash dieback. Each year I look at it and it doesn't seem to be getting any worse. And some of them do have a kind of uh, natural immunity. So I'm just keeping my fingers crossed that this one is going to survive. And this down here is all temperate rainforest. It's, it's according to my interactive map of the lost rainforests of the United Kingdom. This is a, ra a temperate rainforest fragment that runs all the way along the river. And you, you know that because of the amount of moss and lichens and ferns that grow onto the trees and you can see I, I think down there that uh, that branch of the tree has ferns growing along it 
So it's actually very precious. Uh, I don't think people realise that, but, but it is very precious, this area. And the other thing Liam helped me to do was to cut this willow back. Now apparently willow supports more invertebrates than any other tree. So I didn't want to get rid of it, I wanted to keep it, although a lot of people just see it as a weed. And it also screens the, the, the noise from the road. But it is a really good tree for wildlife, so I wanted to keep it. But it was also, as well as growing sort of upwards, because it's grown absolutely huge, it was also growing outwards, and it was um, cutting the light off from a lot of plants underneath and a lot of the other little trees that I planted. So he's, helped, he's cut it back for me, and we put the... Uh, Put the branches on the on the dead hedge. I've planted a native rowan there, and I think I think you can see this. It's sort of leaning over slightly to the left, and I think that was because of the willow. So I'm hoping that now the willow has been cut back, that can grow straight, and then there's the rowan. That's probably five years old now, maybe four. I've just cut the very top off. I, d I did that last year and it bushed out a bit and so I've done it again this year and hope it will bush out a bit more. And then over there is a, a flowering cherry. I planted those both at the same time. They've not exactly grown away, and I think the reason for that is because there's actually no topsoil here at all. It's all builder's rubble covered with sand that uh, Liam put down. With a knife, put a lot of wood chips down. And, um, of course, now things have started to grow up through it, so you're beginning to get this layer of uh, leaf mould and... Uh, composted plants and stuff so the fertility is increasing but what absolutely loves it here is this plant which is sinker foil and it just crawls all over the place it's it is really a thug and I think it just chokes out anything that I've tried to plant I found it very difficult to get anything established here but I also wonder whether it's partly the, the sort of lasting effects of the herbicides that, that were here. So I, I really do think it's taken several years to recover from the herbicides that have been put on it. Oh, you know, for years, really. And then here there are three silver birches. Those two have been in there for a year and that little one there I, I've just planted and I've put them quite close together because apparently they are quite happy um, quite close together and there's a little oak that I planted oh I don't know three or four years ago that came from an acorn and there's a tiny little beach there. And as regards native plants, it's been very difficult to get anything to grow here, really, apart from the sinker foil. You can see that there's one tiny little teasel. Well, I did plant a lot, so they've just not survived at all. One thing that has done okay is knapweed. And there's a patch here. And... There's the seed heads. And last year, I did have a nice evening primrose. And I actually saw a goldfinch on there yesterday, eating the seeds. Oh, and now I look, actually, I can see there's some teasels down there. So maybe this year I shall have uh, a little teasel patch. And I can also see a nice big foxglove there. 
couple of foxgloves. So I might get some foxgloves established. But so this area is just left really. Uh, I come in here in the winter to do uh, a bit of maintenance like the willow and I try and cut out some of the brambles when they start uh, popping up in the spring because if I allowed them the brambles would just completely cover this area and it would just be one big bramble patch. There are brambles all the way round. There's brambles at the back behind the willow and there are brambles over there but the sad thing is of course they will go if they if the owners get planning permission to build the house there then that bramble patch will go and this little area is a bit of a dumping ground really behind the wall so I'm going to let the brambles grow up all over it and this can be the new bramble patch here And there's the promised blue sky and sunshine coming. So I shall definitely come out this afternoon and start to get on with the paths. Thanks for visiting me in my Wild Welsh garden. Hope you've enjoyed the video and seeing a bit more about where I live. If you like the video, please like it and uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't. And I'll see you in the next video. Bye. Oil fire.